this is a perfect example. It's a perfect example of of how of how our nation could frankly be putting money back into its pocket. There's, there isn't a question. There isn't a question. Everyone benefits at every level, including including uh, our healthcare payers that would that would be putting money back into their pocket. From the patient perspective, of course, there's nothing better than receiving instant neurological expertise at the time of need with a neurological emergency like stroke, clearly. For the emergency physicians who are, uh, who are generally uncomfortable making an emergency diagnosis of stroke and, in more importantly, determination of eligibility for this clot-busting medication, they now can work in close partnership and collaboration with the neurological expert, so they benefit. Right. Uh, the community hospitals benefit because, in many cases, we've demonstrated that patients do not need to be transferred from their community to a neurological center uh, following their telemedicine consultation. Of course, a small proportion need to be transferred to higher level of care, but many do not. So the community hospital benefits because they can retain their patient and right. be reimbursed appropriately. The family loves it because the patient stays close at hand right. and, uh, and, can, and can benefit from, from the, the family network of support. And the, even the large comprehensive stroke centers benefit because these institutions have, have a limit to the number of stroke patients they can accommodate in any one time. So this gives a chance for large comprehensive stroke centers to expand their reach, help more people without necessarily populating more of their intensive care unit and emergency department beds. Uh, and right. from the health, from from the insurer point of view, whether it's government or private insurance, uh, this is either a bargain, or in many cases would be construed as a as a cost savings initiative, because any upfront costs associated with supporting the development of a hub and spoke telemedicine network and dynamic, uh, any of those upfront costs are very quickly. Uh, overcome in a favorable way by reducing the long uh, the long term downstream uh, costs associated with prolonged rehabilitation right. or nursing home care or assisted living uh, support over time. In the year two thousand and five, uh, while practicing vascular neurology at Mayo Clinic, stroke neurology. I was working with an emergency physician, uh, Ben Bobro, at the Mayo Clinic. And <clears throat> uh, Ben also served as the, as the Arizona State Director for Emergency Medical Services, Emergency Medical Systems. And the two of us uh, became concerned about the, the gap in neurological care, particularly stroke care, outside of major metropolitan areas like Phoenix and Tucson. So uh, it was our perception that, uh, that in the, th the 37 or so rural hospitals outside of Phoenix and Tucson that there were no neurologists, essentially no physicians equipped to manage acute stroke and that patients were, were not having a timely diagnosis and, and uh, uh, access to, to thrombolysis, for example, if they were eligible. But we, rather than, rather than, than stop there, uh, we elected to uh, survey the state, and uh, we conducted a statewide survey, and it confirmed our suspicion that, that while Phoenix, metropolitan Phoenix, maybe up to 20% of patients were receiving access to clot-busting drugs for stroke. In the remote communities, that proportion was as low as 1% or 2%. Wow. And uh, so that's what motivated us, uh, was the recognition that there was a, a large metropolitan to rural gap in the assessment and, and, and diagnosis and delivery of emergency stroke care. And we, 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 uh, we both we both became aware that telemedicine had recently been employed in the United States and in other countries for emergency stroke, even though neither of us had actually been engaged in that work. Uh, so, so recognizing that there was a need and recognizing that the technology 
was beginning to be utilized for this role, uh, we felt that uh, who better than the two of us to embark on a plan for our state in Arizona. That's, that's how it started. Uh, this is the first. This is the first U.S. cost-effectiveness study for telestroke. Uh, there is one other study internationally. Uh, this is from Denmark, which had uh, very little applicability to to the United States uh, because of the difference in the healthcare system and the way the the model was constructed. So uh, we compared uh, two modes of care. So a remote emergency department that was engaged with a telestroke hub mm -hmm. over the care of a patient with an acute ischemic stroke compared to a remote emergency department that was not receiving stroke expertise by telemedicine or otherwise. So yeah. we were comparing essentially telestroke to usual care. And we gathered, we gathered costs of care from a societal perspective. So uh, we looked at, we looked at uh, a cost of emergency medicine, uh, the, the drug costs, the TPA costs, mm -hmm. the emergency care, the admission, uh, the subsequent uh, rehabilitation, nursing home care, and even the costs associated with the family members uh, caring for the patient uh, long term. And we, we measured the outcome in what's called uh, an incremental cost-effectiveness ratio uh, per quality-adjusted life year gained. So essentially, we were comparing the telestroke scenario to usual care scenario, and we, uh, the, the, final, the final outcome was how many dollars did it cost uh, to, to, to produce an, one additional quality-adjusted life year in the telestroke scenario versus the the uh, the usual care and uh, some other features we uh, the base case was a hub and spoke network so one primary stroke center or comprehensive stroke center acting as the hub in a metropolitan area uh, serving uh, eight remote hospitals in the region yeah. and approximately five four or five neurologists uh, taking turns being on call and providing the consultations either from their home office like this or from uh, sorry their home office uh, or their work office like this uh, and and uh, doing it with a full audio video connection so we we learned we learned that uh, the 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 results were for a ninety day a ninety day horizon. Uh, the cost was approximately ninety thousand dollars per quality adjusted life year. Yeah. Uh, for the lifetime horizon, the cost was approximately two thousand uh, dollars per quality adjusted life year. Right. So, so ultimately, ultimately, the the answer is that this modality is cost effective. Uh, the average person may not may not uh, intuitively understand what what that cost per quality adjusted life year means, uh, but. But uh, I, I could share the fact that uh, as, a, as a comparison, for example, it costs approximately, costs approximately uh, $50,000, $50,000 to $100,000 per quality adjusted life year for dialysis, for example, for patients with end-stage kidney disease. And uh, our, our, our own country has determined that everyone has the right to have access to dialysis if they have end-stage kidney disease. So we believe that uh, therapies, treatments that cost somewhere between fifty dollars to $100,000 per quality adjusted life year or less uh, would meet criteria as being cost-effective. Yeah. And, and really, uh, for the long-term horizon, $2,000 per quality adjusted life year is, is uh, by any measure, a bargain. It's a, it's a bargain. It sure sounds that way, especially in that comparison. Um, so, and, and this is something I'll be focusing on in this piece, is this notion, if the benefits are so clear-cut, or maybe they're becoming more clear-cut, um, what are the impediments to having this happen more, uh, more in a more widespread way? And it sounded like from some other uh, papers that I read that it's more administrative, legal, uh, liability, yeah. profit-sharing issues than the technology. The technology sounds like a no-brainer. <clears throat> the obstacles are as you describe. Even though the neurologists and the emergency physicians at the two different ends of the relationship 
both recognize that this kind of a dynamic is effective, much more effective, more superior to telephone consultation. Uh, we understand that the impediments are largely uh, reimbursement, so that in in many circumstances, in in many circumstances, perhaps even most circumstances, the 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 encounter itself the there is no means for professional reimbursement uh, for the neurologists and the stroke physicians that provide care in this fashion by government and non-government insurers. Uh, we understand that another impediment is uh, essentially the, the, uh, the medical legal uh, climate, uh, the limitation in, in, uh, in uh, uh, cross-state practice, for example, yeah. having neurologists to have to have uh, licenses in, in multiple states in order to have a reach or build a network that's larger. Uh, and, and then uh, the, the uh, other, other issues uh, of administrative nature, so training, uh, organization, structure, uh, the, 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 uh, the administrative dynamic. The technology... The technology is becoming very easy to use. It's becoming uh, in, uh, cheaper and cheaper as the years as the years go by. So, it's a technology is affordable. It's user friendly. Uh, what I would what I would say with all, with all of that as a background, uh, what I would say is that our study that demonstrates that the telestroke consultation for an emergency stroke patient uh, is extraordinarily cost-effective. I would urge that uh, insurers, both government and non-government, really should add an urgent telestroke consultation as a covered benefit. There's no, there's no doubt about it. Uh, and the lack of uniform reimbursement to date is probably one of the largest barriers uh, to adopting this technology. So right now, even in places like Arizona, where this is already in practice, that's not a reimbursed, uh, that's, reimbursable that's, thing? That's correct. In, in right. over 50% of the remote and rural regions that are covered by our network that have no access to neurology care, uh, there, is, there is no opportunity for reimbursement. So it's essentially a public service. <laughs> well, we were fortunate that the Arizona Department of Health Services funded all of the early work uh, with, uh, with, the, with the STAR program, the Stroke Telemedicine for Arizona Rural, uh, rural uh, uh, Residents Network. And Arizona Department of Health Services funded approximately one and a half million dollars uh, to over over four years for some of the pivotal randomized controlled trials to confirm safety and effectiveness, and also funded a 500 prospective subject registry, and uh, and urged us to develop a sustainable business model to follow, which is the stage that we are at at the moment. Hmm. One thing that one thing that will help that was recently introduced by CMS, uh, and you may be familiar with it, was a streamlined credentialing and privileging uh, program for for telemedicine, hmm. uh, so that telemedicine providers could utilize their own credentialing and privileging at the hub hospital to fulfill the credentialing and privileging at all the spoke hospitals with within which they uh, practice or at which they practice. Oh, that's interesting. So that, that will reduce the administrative burden associated with credentialing and privileging. That's one thing that can help. The other thing that, uh, that we believe uh, federally could help with, with uh, cooperation and participation by the states would be, would be uh, a, a central a telemedicine licensing system so that uh, a telemedicine provider from any state could apply to a central body that might that might incorporate multiple states or the entire United States a streamlined uh, licensing application that was that was uh, targeted to telemedicine and that and that once fulfilled could allow that provider to practice anywhere in the United States that that uh, uh, that um, uh, that participated in, in, a, in a broad program such as that. I think that there is still also a, an opportunity for uh, more state and federal funding for telemedicine technology mm -hmm. so that uh, even though we've demonstrated that this is a cost-effective 
uh, program and network uh, for individual hospitals to afford the telemedicine equipment. Sometimes that can be uh, that can be uh, an un- unaffordable or or difficult, challenging. Sure. So so grants for telemedicine equipment would be welcome. And then, as always, broadening uh, so b- broadband coverage uh, into all the far reaches. Of the United States uh, would 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 also be would be uh, uh, essential. 